This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by the new Daniel Suarez novel Change Agent, a fast-paced thriller set in a future world where genetic engineering is commonplace. To learn more, listen to our interview with Daniel back in episode 251, or visit his website at thedemon.com. So that's T-H-E-D-A-E-M-O-N.com. Wired.com presents... The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 252 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Titus Chalk. He's a writer and broadcaster based in Berlin, Germany, and he's covered sports, culture, and gaming for outlets such as Deutsche Welle, Tagesspiegel, and 442. And we'll be speaking with him today about his first book, Generation Dex, the unofficial history of gaming phenomenon Magic the Gathering. And today's show is brought to you by Change Agent by Daniel Suarez. And here's a description of the book. It says, In 2045, Kenneth Durand leads Interpol's most effective team against genetic crime, hunting down black market labs that perform vanity edits on human embryos and that use human trafficking victims as unwilling test subjects. Durand soon learns that one figure looms behind it all, Marcus Demang Wicks, leader of a powerful and sophisticated cartel known as the Huli Jing. But the cartel has identified Durand too. After being forcibly dosed with a radical new change agent, Durand wakes from a coma to find that he's been genetically transformed into someone else, his most wanted suspect, Wix. Now a fugitive, pursued through the genetic underworlds by his former colleagues, Durand is determined to restore his original DNA by locating the source of the mysterious change agent, but finding his enemy will be more difficult than he ever imagined. With the technology to genetically edit the living, Wix and his Huli Jing could be anyone, and they have plans to undermine identity itself. Publishers Weekly writes, The depth and sophistication of Suarez's dystopian world, not to mention his facility at making complex science intelligible to the non-expert, rivals anything Michael Crichton ever did. Daniel's novels have also received high praise from figures such as Chris Anderson, former editor-in-chief of Wired, and William O'Brien, former director of cybersecurity and communications policy at the White House. And again, if you missed our interview with Daniel back in episode 251, I'd strongly encourage you to go check that out because it's a conversation that's just full of really interesting ideas. And so again, the book is called Change Agent by Daniel Suarez, and you can learn more at thedemon.com. And again, that's T-H-E-D-A-E-M-O-N.com. All right, and so now let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Titus Chalk. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Okay, so first of all, just tell us a bit about how Magic the Gathering got started. Oh, wow. Okay, that's a very long story. But um, you're really looking back into the early 90s and uh, a somewhat different gaming landscape to today's, of course. Um, it was really the brainchild of uh, a student at the time, Richard Garfield, and he was doing his maths PhD over on one side of the US in Philadelphia, whilst uh, a young games company called Wizards of the Coast, completely unknown in sort of 92, um, was beginning to look for new games to produce. And the founder of that company, Peter Atkinson, went on the internet, quite revolutionary at the time, uh, looking on news groups um, for, for new talent. And he got in touch with uh, um, a friend of Richard Garfield's who had a board game to pitch. And this sort of brought them together for the first time. Peter Adkinson and Wizards of the Coast couldn't produce a board game, much too expensive, as you can imagine, for a startup to make these kind of complex, uh, sort of colourful boards and the, all the pieces you need for a board game. But he did have this idea, um, and he said, hey, look, you know, I'm looking for a sort of portable game, maybe a card game, that uh, role players could play at conventions in between, in between long gaming sessions. And uh, Richard Garfield, the, the maths PhD student, went home, thought this over and came back with this brilliant idea, which quickly turned into Magic the Gathering, the first collectible card game. Right. And so you make the point in the book that this was really revolutionary. You say it was kind of as revolutionary as Dungeons and Dragons had been earlier. Um, yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, it was a real sort of paradigm shift in gaming. I mean, if you think about it up until that point, if you said to someone, hey, let's play a game, what did you do? Well, you went and you bought this set, you know, or you went and you bought a deck of cards, one between however many people, and you doled out the contents, you know, you tipped the Monopoly board on the table, hmm. and you, you sort of, you shared, 
that set and everything was there. I think the the really interesting, well, one of the really interesting things about Magic was that the design Richard Garfield came up with was this broke this idea of having a complete set and was rather, hey, every player can collect their own cards and design and sort of curate their little collection of cards into their own pile that they then play against an opponent's pile of cards. And that idea completely changed the sort of nature of the game and 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 turned it into not only the game that you play when you sit down with your opponent, but this kind of meta game of, oh, I want to go and collect all the cards that are out there. You know, they've got to catch them all. That That really came from there, this idea oh, wow, there are some cards which are a bit rarer than others. They're a bit more powerful. Maybe I haven't even seen all the cards that exist, but I want to get out there and collect them and buy them, which is handy for a company making a game, Mm -hmm. um, and put them into my deck. And um, that really was groundbreaking at the time. Yeah, and one thing I thought was really interesting was that they didn't have any idea whether this would actually work. It was so new, and so they had to just make a deck and, and see if this thing worked at all. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, Richard Garfield, a very smart guy, a very sort of spacey, <laughs> spacey guy. Yes, you can imagine someone who's inventing all these games all the time. I mean, you know, at the time he already had a cupboard full of, uh, you know, half finished games. This was his passion. Um, but he, 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 he twigged instinctively on this idea. OK, let's let's make this collectible um, and let's make each card have its own individual effect on the game its own its own rules if you will that it sort of break the overarching rule set of the game or that can do something unique and individual he 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 latched onto that idea but even when he went and pitched it to um peter adkinson and wizards of the coast who made the game he sort of had to lower their expectations because he didn't know if it was actually possible to involve uh, to, possible to um design a game with that many moving parts you know which was as modular as, as that design implies, you know, where you can really can have all these different cards, thousands of them, and keep extrapolating on this idea for people to collect all these cards and curate their own decks. It, it had never been done. And there were a few missteps, right? Because there were, were there the nine cards that ended up, they ended up having to take them out of the game because they were too powerful? Sure, yeah. Um, so, um, Again, because this was something that no one really had any experience of, when they sat down to play test the game, um, Richard Garfield and his friends at, in the maths department of the University of uh, Pennsylvania, um, they they tried to simulate what it would be like uh, for, for for people to be playing this game in real life. So they printed up on a you know very rudimentary. Uh, on a photocopier, made made a, a number of copies of the cards and sort of mixed them all up in a big bin bag and doled them out to the playtesters. And they were thinking, well, you know, once this game comes out, maybe people will buy one deck of cards, you know, one deck of cards and maybe a few supplementary cards and that'll be what they're playing with. Um, so they'd underestimated the power of a, a lot of these cards in the game, including this fabled Power 9, which are today worth a, a lot of money. Um, because they just simply underestimated how how people would fall in love with this game and just go out and buy so many um, that the the cards they thought were going to be very rare were actually going to crop up a lot more readily and, and be abused by players who just loved to sort of find all the combinations um, in the game and really extract every every clever combo they could and uh, to use it in, in in beating their opponents so there were definitely teething problems and uh, you know but i think that's really speaks to how unique the game was and uh, how quickly people just were desperate to find out everything that they could do with this very new form of gaming i mean what would be an example of one of the cards that does something that you're like now we just can't allow that to continue <sighs> Okay, um, so I, I don't know how many listeners are really familiar with Magic, but I'll try and kind of explain a card in in the context uh, of of how how powerful it is compared to a sort of bog standard Magic card. So there's a card which is perhaps the most fabled in the game, which is called the Black Lotus. Um, if you imagine in a game of Magic, uh, the turns go back and forth between the two players, and each turn. Um, you're allowed to put one land card into play, which gives you one mana. And a mana is the sort of currency in the game that you're managing to be able to 
use the other cards in your hand. So each turn, if you get one mana, one more mana, you can gradually do more and more powerful things in the game. Now, the Black Lotus is a card that comes into play and it gives you three mana of one color. So it's a bit like you've taken three turns in a row to develop your resources in a way that your opponent hasn't, and that's incredibly powerful. So that was one of the cards that immediately just blew everyone's mind and very quickly um, became a problem for sort of early tournaments and, and was gradually kind of phased out of uh, most magic play. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, one thing reading this book that I had never really appreciated back when I was a kid playing magic and stuff was that Wizards of the Coast was this really shoestring operation at the beginning. Um, you compare it to kind of like an internet startup uh, before the internet. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I think, you know, um, you look at Wizards of the Coast today, I mean, for anyone who doesn't know, Wizards of the Coast is now owned by Hasbro. It's a, a massive company, lots of people working very hard, uh, very clever people putting out these these magic cards. Um, but, you know, when they started, they were just working out of uh, the founder, Peter Atkinson's basement. And it was, you know, half a dozen people um, not earning very much money, you know, really in it for the love. Uh, very similar to the kind of startup culture that we see um, amongst Internet companies today and desperately trying to, to make ends meet. And that sort of financial difficulty did mean uh, magic got off to a, a very sort of difficult birth and, and almost didn't happen at all because there just wasn't much money at the time to make something that was this radical. And, uh, I, you know, one thing I mentioned in the book is that it, even just to get together this many illustrations, you know, if you imagine each magic card, again, for people who haven't seen magic cards, each card has a, has a lovely full color illustration on it. Well, that was just, again, something quite revolutionary at the time. If you think, you know, illustrating a, a board game okay there's maybe a, a board and some playing pieces and there's a handful of cards but if you have to pay to illustrate 300 or so cards which which was the number that they first released well that's a huge cost for a very very small company so things like that really were a huge obstacle to, to making the game in the first place when they were using art students right to to do the illustrations yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the really, I mean, that's personally one of the things I love uh, about the game and, and, and that made me fall in love with the game. I mean, I, I discovered the game when I was a, a teenager in New Zealand, um, which is, as, <laughs> as you'd imagine, pretty far from the center of the universe. But, um, you know, I'd moved there in straightened times. My, my parents had actually had a gaming company of their own, which had uh, gone bust and we'd been forced to sell our house and you know I was starting a new school and, and feeling very out of sorts but um, you know some some slightly geeky friends said hey there's this new game do you want to try it and one of the things I discovered in the game was just these amazing illustrations which weren't like the fantasy illustrations that I was seeing in other games at the time and part of the reason for that is because they did turn to local Seattle students um, you know, who were desperate for a paying gig. Um, and they weren't sort of by definition fantasy artists. They were just art students from the local art school um, interpreting their briefs in a very different way to someone who'd been perhaps steeped in kind of D&D &D culture or, you know, whatever the prevailing uh, fantasy culture was at the time. And um, I, yeah, I, I kind of, I really love that. I really loved um, the sort of, much more abstract feel of these cards. They were really different. And you, you're thinking as well, you know, early 90s, um, you know, I for one was just a massive <laughs> grunge fan at the time. And to see this kind of, you know, strange, creative game coming out of Seattle, it just kind of tapped into the whole mythology around Seattle at the time of being the center of this really kind of strange, misfit, you know, rock and roll grungy uh, uh, culture that, that just was, you know, mind-blowing for, for kids, you know, especially far-flung teenagers in New Zealand picking up this game at the same time listening to Nirvana in the background while they're playing it. It was just, it was just the whole package. It was like, wow, this is, this is mind-blowing. One, one thing with the art, I had never actually consciously noticed this before, but you say that they, had tried, they were trying to get away from the, you know, half-naked women chained to dungeon walls and things that had been pervasive in fantasy art at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, 
I think Magic, um, like unfortunately a lot of games has a, or, or a lot of fandoms really, has a pretty uh, tough time um, when it comes to kind of attracting a more diverse crowd to it. And, um, you know, that's something that the game's trying to address in fits and starts. But I think it's creditable that um, even at the game's inception, uh, Richard Garfield, the creator, was very much sort of aware that, you know, there were certain tropes in role playing and kind of, you know, wider fantasy gaming at the time, which deserved to be snuffed out. And one of them was the barbarian coming to the rescue of the scantily clad princess, you know, tied to a stake. And so they were very, very keen to, um, you know, do away with that in the, in the art of the game in the hope that it might attract a new sort of gamer and and attract more women. Um, You know, that, alone wasn't enough to attract more women to the game unfortunately but i think it was still a kind of pretty worthy attempt to again um harness the sort of newness of this gaming form and say hey we are very very different to what's come beforehand and and perhaps they sort of tapped tapped into the you know sort of emerging 90s zeitgeist at the time in doing that yeah. Okay. So I just love this story where, so Peter Atkinson is, his day job is he's working at Boeing and there's this janitor, Marilyn, who he is talking to. Tell us about that. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is one of the, the most wonderful stories. I mean, uh, that, 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 that I encountered when I was researching the book and Peter Atkinson's a, a really lovely guy and was very forthcoming about, you know, all the ups and downs of uh, making magic. But yeah, he was uh, in his day job at Boeing, which is one of the big kind of uh, companies up in Seattle, employs a lot of people. Um, And again, at the time, you've got to imagine that people didn't have access to, you know, the kind of computers we've got at home now. I mean, I'm sitting here talking on a Mac, all singing, all dancing. Um, That wasn't the case in 1992. So Peter Atkinson had much better computers at work than he did in his basement. And he would stay late at night you know, while the janitors are making their round, working on his new gaming company. And uh, Marilyn, one of the janitors at Boeing, would be sort of, you know, chatting to him every night. Hey, why are you staying so late at work, Mr. Atkinson? And she gradually uh, heard about what he was working on. Now, as he was desperately trying to scrape together the money to print magic, he was obviously looking for investors of, you know, all sorts, uh, including, you know, rival game companies, anyone he thought could back this 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 project which sounded nutty to a lot of people but uh, one evening marilyn came up to him and gave him a check for her life savings and said do you know what um i don't understand what you are doing i don't understand what a fantasy game is but i see you working every night so hard that i i believe you're going to make it here's my life savings um i'd like some shares please invest it in your game and uh, and uh, later on, when the game did very well, uh, she was able to to make a lot of money, uh, despite her family's protestations at the time that she was doing something crazy and uh, shouldn't be investing her savings in something as, uh, you know, childish as a fantasy game. But um, I think that's absolutely wonderful. And I'm really glad it worked out for Marilyn and uh, for, 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 for Peter Agnenton and all us Magic players. Well, right. And her life savings was not an enormous amount of money. She says it was about $1,000. Exactly. And... Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this is... You know, just a very modest, you know, woman of pretty modest means um, and who later uh, got very rich when the company was sold to Hasbro. So it was a, a real a sort of uh, vote of faith in Peter Atkinson and the game. And uh, something that I think all Magic players should should look on and be grateful. And she needed the money, you say, because he had actually mortgaged his house to print these cards. Yeah, I mean, this was, you know, this was really uh, being produced on an absolute shoestring. And yes, Peter Atkinson did Morganges house to help raise, I think it was uh, off the top of my head, I think it was um, 10000 no, uh, $100,000 to uh, print, uh, to uh, print the initial print run of the game. And um, so, you know, it was, it, yeah, like I said, a, a real budget operation, as you can imagine, people uh, in this basement in uh, uh, near Seattle, um, doing this out of love you know really uh not not uh, not getting rich quick certainly um so yeah it's 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 really a miracle the game got made and it's fantastic that it's gone on from there to be uh, to be what it is today yeah so so the game comes out and it starts to pick up steam and at first it encounters some resistance i mentioned you know that i grew up i was playing magic as a kid and i actually grew up in the bedford school district 
Oh, and really? Where the um, yeah, there was this big controversy about Magic being this satanic game that kids shouldn't be playing at school. And I had not actually realized at the time what a big story that was until I read your book. But um, yeah, just tell us about that insanity. Yeah, I mean, um, it's really interesting because uh, I guess in in the early 90s, I mean, when I was playing the game in New Zealand, I was about 14, 15. And again, you know, the idea of getting on the internet and talking to other people might, who might be playing the game was was you know, mind blowing. We, we just wouldn't have had access to that. So we heard all these rumors, you know, secondhand. Oh, there's a guy at the game shop who says, you know, there's a school somewhere who's banned this game. And, you know, and so when I started looking into some of that, that kind of apocrypha around the game, I, I you know, I'd heard of schools in Asia who would banned it. And then I, I did stumble upon the story of um, what was happening in the district where you were going to school at the time. Um, where a uh, where a nun, I think she was a, a nun or an ex nun, who was raising um, her grandchild in a school in the in the Bedford district, took offence at some of the magic cards that she'd seen being you know played with in uh, in in her grandson's um, uh, sort of age group and because some of these cards you know I was praising the art a moment ago for being pretty iconoclastic you know there were cards with a, a you know literally called demonic tutor or sacrifice or they had a pretty sort of edgy feel to them i guess at the time um and uh, some people took offense to this and this this one woman in the bedford school district um tried to get magic banned and it led to this big hoo-ha where the 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 uh governor for the district um had to ban it in his schools and he then sort of took the game to child psychologists and said, look, is there anything here that could harm kids? Uh, and he had to sort of get this clean bill of health, health for the game to allow kids to to play it in the school district. But um, unfortunately, he was up against this sort of, you know, uh, Christian fundamentalist movement who, who were using magic as a kind of thin end of the wedge to try and promote um sort of censorship in the school district and it ended in in a massive legal fight that took years to clear up um and was really uh yeah something that i think um you know a lot of magic players at the time were just you know blown away by um and, and it led to in the sort of short term for a few years after that uh, you know magic didn't dare include any demons any devils anything that could be accused of uh uh, you know, fall foul of um, anyone with uh, religious beliefs. Um, so, yeah, again, it, I mean, I think it's just a, a reflection of how how different um, sort of pop gaming culture was at the time. You know, uh, it, it, I think it, we underestimate the effect that things like um, the Lord of the Rings films have had and the Harry Potter books have had in in kind of making us just overall a little more accepting, a little a little more geeky to you know to use that word um and i think that yeah it's 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 really quite incredible to think that that was such a problem back in the day but yeah there there you have it you're lucky to have been playing magic at all <laughs> well and i mean th this woman it sounds like her her issue wasn't just oh i'm offended by this but it sounds like she was just completely out of touch with reality and you say that at one point uh, the um principal had to have a exorcist come in to make sure the library wasn't infested by demons. It's just like crazy stuff. Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, like I, I don't want to put anyone down for their beliefs. You know, of course, people are welcome to believe in what they want. But I, all I can say is as a teenager uh, over in New Zealand, gleefully trading cards and slamming them on the tabletop every lunchtime, I just thought, oh, my God, this these rumors of the game being banned are just crackers. Um, and, you know, I, I want to get on with playing my game. Um, yeah, it's 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 very sad. Um, I'm I'm, you know, I I feel sorry for anyone whose worldview is that that small, really, um, that you would be looking to censor books or games or you know anything that could be creative and fun for for for, for young kids. Yeah. Okay. So then another thing I thought was just so interesting in this book is how conscious Wizards of the Coast was that this could easily just be a fad that would burn out right away and all of the strategy that they employed to try to make sure that didn't happen. Um, could you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, 
again, it's you know, it's it's testament to really just how radical this game was. That the company who made it didn't really know what to do with it. You know, um, I don't know again how how familiar listeners are, but I, certainly I get the sense that most kind of if you were in a US high school in the 90s, you would have probably seen Magic Cards at the very least. You know, there was this moment after they came out in kind of summer of 93 where they really just rocketed for for a, a couple of years into all sorts of unexpected places, be it, you know, playgrounds of, uh, uh, you know, upstate New York schools or playgrounds in New, in New Zealand. You know, these really did suddenly shoot to a kind of prominence that no one had expected. And that, for a tiny company that had suddenly been transformed into earning, you know, huge paydays was, was a real struggle. They, they just didn't have the business acumen to really know what to do with this game. And they were certainly very lucky at the start because the demand for cards was so huge uh, and the collectability of the cards was such that people were desperately buying them because they were rocketing up in value. Um, there was a secondary market for cards. So, you know, if, if you wanted the Black Lotus for your deck, for example, um, and you couldn't, you couldn't trade for it, you could, you know, or you didn't open it in your own packs, you could go and buy it from someone. And so there was this kind of overheated bubble forming in the game where people kept spending money on the game because the packs or the individual cards were going to rise in value. But it, it led to a sort of speculation that was beginning to become a little bit worrisome you know what what would happen to this bubble was it going to be like a, a collecting fad you know was it going to be like the garbage pail kids or was it going to be like you know um you know beanie babies or whatever the equivalent is you know something that's pure collectible if it's got no you know other value then the bubble quickly bursts comics of course are you know uh, another example of that um so yeah it it was like the Wizards of the Coast really had to come up with a strategy on the fly of how they would manage this incredible popularity. So um, they started looking at other games that had kind of gone on to become classics, you know, uh, be it your chess or your poker, you know, games that have had that kind of long longevity in our culture to last, you know, decades, not just a couple of years of being really popular. And they also started to look at something else they thought was analogous, which was, which was, professional sport you know how how you know how how the development for that worked how the sort of grassroots fed into you know the very top levels um and one guy um Scaf Elias at, at Wizards of the Coast hit upon this idea which was like hey you know why don't we um start a kind of big money professional magic tournament a, you know tournament series and this was really controversial at the time. You know, this is before esports or whatever we take for granted now. Um, this was at a time where, yes, there was a little bit of tournament play happening, but uh, Magic was so steeped in this kind of artistic side, like I'd said, um, that people were very resistant to making it too serious. You know, there was this real mystique around the game, and, and people were very scared that. I don't know, that it was just going to be, you know, t again, too competitive. You think about the people who were picking this game up at the start, and it, was, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't your, your kind of football quarterbacks. You know, it was the people who had kind of shied away from that a bit more in their, you know, in their, in, their, in their adolescence. They were looking for something kind of fun and creative, and there was real fear within Wizards of the Coast that coming up with this big money tournament series was just going to be complete anathema to players but at the same time they realized oh you know this might be the way to kind of really make the game about playing it rather than you know hoarding it speculating on it selling cards at a profit and and kind of you know in some ways providing quite a bad experience for for those early players who were having to fork out lots of money to get their back black lotus or whatever, so um, they they hit upon this strategy of like, well, let's let's um, let's make this a bit more like a sport, you know. Let's let's try and have a very top tier where you can come along and you can prove your metal and win a big check for playing Magic the Gathering. And again, you know, that was a really radical idea at the time, but 
it absolutely transformed magic and I think gaming culture more widely in that it legitimized what people were doing. You know, if um, there's, a, there's a quote in the book from one of the very few executives who was behind the idea at the time, Rick Ahrens, uh, and he said, you know, your grandmother might not understand what Magic the Gathering is, but she will understand what a check for $10,000 is. <laughs> and I think that's really important. You know, I, I hate the idea that everything's kind of, you know, measured in money or how successful you are is down to what you earn or any of that nonsense. But at the same time, it's just something that's completely transparent and, and people understand outside of whatever circle, you know, you happen to be part of. So it was Wizards way of saying, hey, we know you guys are really, really into this game. We know you want to work hard and be the best and come up with all these really creative ideas to, to you know, win games and magic. And we're going to reward that. And I think that had an absolutely massive effect on the self-esteem of early players who could, you know, like I said, they weren't the quarterbacks. You know, they were they were the nerds at school in many ways. Many of them had been sort of picked on or uh, felt, you know, shut out from the popular clique at school or whatever. But this was their way of being able to say, hey, you know, I can go and compete for a big check and come back and say, do you know what? I did something pretty legitimate. And for me, that's really one of the biggest effects uh, or sort of influences, at least, that the game had at the time, which was just helping to legitimize gaming culture. Right. And I thought it was so interesting, too, that you talk about in the early days of these tournaments that a lot of the players were there, these very young guys, and they're suddenly making all this money and did not really have a professional outlook. And that Wizards was kind of desperate to find somebody who would be the magic pro who would have, um, you know, who would be someone that you would look up to and admire. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, you know, it's like uh, they they set this up, of course, but they just didn't know who was going to turn up. You know, they, they 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 had the hope that they were going to find a, a sort of worthy champion to front the game and and make you know uh, magic legitimate. Um, to use that word again, I mean, but the, there were teething problems, of course. You know, and that meant that, that there was a lot of. Uh, sort of rivalries <laughs> emerged at the Pro Tour. There was a lot of bad behavior. There was a lot of, you know, just kind of amateurism, if you will. This was a, a, a learning process for, for not only the players, you know, suddenly having money thrown at them, um, but also um, Wizards of the Coast. How, you know, how do you, how do you really go about setting this up? How do, you, how do you inject this money into this culture that has previously been quite marginalized and where perhaps... Um, some marginal behavior is going to persist. Um, and they couldn't script it in the way that, you know, the WWE might. They, but they did want to, you know, find champions to back. And they did also stumble on uh, a sort of famous bad boy in the game who they were quite happy to, if not promote, at least kind of uh, allowed to flourish, um, a guy called Mike Long. Um, because these were the characters that made this into a narrative you know you watch sport because you want to see your guy beat whoever it is you know what i mean you you want to cheer for i don't know you want to cheer for lionel messi you want to cheer for muhammad ali you want to cheer for wh whoever it is you know sports games they need heroes uh, and that was um definitely something that wizards of the coast were aware of but there were definitely teething problems um you know one one guy that perhaps the most famous magic player coming into the start of professional magic was a chap called mark justice and unfortunately the pressure was was too much for him and and he had a, a sort of meteoric rise and terrible fall which involved um you know a lot of drugs and alcohol so um definitely teething problems at the start well right there's this really poignant moment in the book where mark justice is vomiting into a toilet and sees John Finkel, a new up and coming player and says to him, don't let this happen to you. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I must say, um, chatting to Mark Justice was uh, one of the most rewarding parts of researching the book. Um, it, you know, he'd come from a very conservative upbringing in Utah. He'd, he'd had a Mormon upbringing and he'd um, discovered magic, loved it, but I think it really introduced him to a whole new world beyond the community that he was used to. And that presented a lot of challenges for him. You know, it, it sort of opened his eyes um, and introduced him to perhaps a, a community that he wished he belonged to instead. Um, 
and so he he really had difficulty in dealing with that um he'd been va- uh, married very young within the mormon faith and um the game sort of well literally led to the breakup of of that marriage um his his wife had said when she'd seen magic cards hey you've brought the devil into our house and that was obviously something that was really difficult for a, a young man to deal with um particularly with you know perhaps not the kind of uh, more you know uh, the socialization to handle that and so he did end up getting really drunk and doing lots of drugs and partying in a sort of desperate attempt to fit in but also perhaps kind of tear down this uh, very conservative community that he'd he'd been raised in and that did lead to him unfortunately you know being sick in a toilet bowl at Grand Prix Mainz uh, and and saying to John Finkel who was a young up and coming player yeah don't don't let this happen to you don't let this pressure don't let this spotlight this sudden chance that we've been given uh you know leave you in this state um but yeah i'm really grateful to mark justice he was a really candid uh person to talk to he hadn't spoken to the press for about 15 years um when i interviewed him so it was really amazing to be able to tell his story and uh you know i'm I'm glad to say he's he's doing much better now yeah well that's great no and so tell us too about john finkel because he sounds like a really interesting character uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think if you've never played Magic before, um, there's, you know, there's a handful of, let's say, you know, household names or players that you might have had a chance of hearing of. And John Finkel's one of them. Um, he's, I think he's really the most emblematic player in the development of the game. He, he He's the player who, I think all Magic players identify with him because he's the guy who really went from being absolutely brutally bullied at school to being the world champion you know of of enjoying the legitimacy of this game of winning big money at the pro tour um he he was just an incredibly smart guy he had a bit of a, a troubled childhood he came from a very smart parents um they'd moved abroad to england briefly he was from new jersey he discovered the game in england um, um but uh, his his dad's job took them back to the US um into this environment where he'd been bullied you know was pretty unhappy um but he he really used the game as like his his solace uh, he was playing at a new york store um uh, a sort of uh, iconic store called uh, neutral ground and he was so in love with the game that he would play all day at the store and then he would sleep on the benches at the station instead of going home and he would come back as soon as the store opened the next day and he would play more magic um and he just blew people away with like his understanding of the game at a time when strategy was very primitive you know we didn't have um as much access to the internet there was uh, you know there was just not this understanding of quite the nitty-gritty of the game in the way that there is now and he had this ability to really kind of instinctively make these wonderful plays you know see two three steps ahead of his opponents and he rocketed to success um became world champion won a number of pro tours um and went from this really this this outcast who'd been bullied you know who was kind of fat and in baggy clothes and messy and he he was able to capitalize on this change and you know really garner some self-esteem on the way you know start going to the gym and start taking care of himself invest a little of his winnings in uh you know in new clothes and just stuff like that which perhaps other people take for granted in their walks of life but this was a massive transformation for him and he's gone on to be a very successful uh, hedge fund manager um and, and so that that really is the the kind of classic magic story that I think a lot of people who play the game relate to. You know, you might not have been bullied quite as brutally as John Finkel, and you might not have become world champion, but you probably picked up the game because you felt like you wanted to belong to something. You know, uh, like in my case in New Zealand, I was desperate to make friends, and that was my chance. And I've gone on to, you know, play the game, have a lot of fun with it. And so I think anyone who's gone through that identifies with John Finkel and uh, it's wonderful to see him still playing today he's you know perhaps not as committed to the game as he, as he was in his heyday but he still turns up to the pro tour still puts on a, a fantastic show and people love to see him play 
Well, so you mentioned that he's not as invested in magic as he had been in the past, but that's partially because he got into professional poker, like high stakes poker, right? Tell us about that. Sure, yeah. I mean, John Finkel was one of a number of players, again, who had, um, they'd, they'd come up through the Pro Tour ranks, okay? They were teenagers, perhaps, when they started playing magic, and they'd suddenly been exposed to this high pressure environment, um, you know, playing under the lights at the Pro Tour. You had in the early days, uh, film crews from ESPN2 filming what was going on. Um, and they were you know, playing for big money. They were, they were used to this pressure and they were used to kind of, um, some of the skills that are applicable in poker. Not quite, you know, counting the cards, I guess, but dealing with the, the, the random part of the game. Um, you know, knowing when to, know when to get aggressive or not and knowing, yeah, just, just being used to dealing with what's, what's called variance. Um, you don't know what's going to come off the deck, just as you don't know what the next card's going to be in poker. And you have to sort of manage that and, and still have a strategy for coping with that. Um, and as, as nice as it was for them to win a bit of money on the Pro Tour, these kids, including John Finkel and some other uh, uh, pro players at the time, looked at poker and thought, Do you know what, um, maybe there's something for us there. And a lot of it, weirdly, was inspired by this Matt Damon film, rounders which you may or may not have seen it's it's okay but matt matt damon plays a a a poker player in that who's kind of uh trying to raise money to pay off debts to a a a mobster played by uh, john malkovich i think and for whatever reason this caught players imagination when it came out in 96 97 and they thought well you know what you know we're pretty good at playing cards why don't we give poker a crack at the same time, you had the sort of first inklings of online poker happening and uh, players who would normally not have been able to go and learn the game at casino, sitting at home, you know, under 18 perhaps at the time, watching over someone's shoulder, learning the game in a wholly different way. And as soon as they turned 18, they turned up to the World Series of Poker in Las Vegas and uh, made a huge impression. You blew this very staid, uh, you know, gaming culture out, out, out of the water. Uh, one guy, David Williams, I think it was the 2004 World Series of Poker, which was like this you're coming out for uh, players raised on magic. He uh, ended up uh, coming second, I think, and, and netting $3.5 million. So it was, you know, they, they'd learned that they'd cut their teeth on this fantasy game and then gone and shaken up a, a more traditional game. And I think really part of that was this, this journey towards um, self-esteem and being legitimate, um, you know, again, People sort of understand what's going on with poker. They get the idea that it's somehow, uh, you know, more more legitimate or something that they understand a little bit better um, than than magic. However, however good for magic the Pro Tour's been. So this was people's chance to just go win a bunch of money and say, Do you know what, we're we're pretty good at this. Right, and so there's this line where John Finkel says that magic is more complex than poker. And so if you can do magic, I mean, it sounds like they just walked in and just slaughtered these guys, you know. Yeah, to some degree. I mean, obviously, um, I think it was uh, almost the, the Wild West in poker at that time, you know, where where um, the, just, the, again, the culture wasn't as developed. There wasn't as many people practicing their skills online um, as you might have today. So it was really ripe for these young, um, sort of battle-hardened card players to go in and, and go in and clean up and and they duly did you know they had no problem with that at all um and yeah you know i don't play poker certainly not at a high level or anything so i'm not well versed in, in all the skills that cross over but there is a big crossover between uh, magic players and poker players now and a lot of magic players see magic more as what they do for fun um, but they can earn their money playing poker using much the same skill set and you say there's a whole book about this, Johnny Magic and the Card Shark Kids by David Kushner. You know, I, I interviewed David Kushner in episode 207 about Masters of Doom, which is one of my favorite books, but I've never heard of this one. Um, is, it, is it good? Yeah, absolutely. I think he did this after Masters of Doom. So um, for anyone who doesn't know, David Kushner uh, is a journalist um, who's also worked at Wired. And um, yeah, he did this uh, the fantastic book, Johnny, Johnny Magic and the Card Shark Kids. Um, which is kind of a precursor to my book. In uh, he, he, it's like a, a more a biography of John Finkel and an exploration of this crossover with with poker. Um, and it's it's a great book. It was really inspiring to me. Um, it, it really helped me 
uh, believe that magic had a story that was worth telling to a wider audience. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I took a different approach. I think David uh, focused on, on, on one player um, and, and was very much writing, I think, from sort of outside the magic community. I, I think he'd be the first to admit that. Um, so I wanted to try and do something which was a bit more comprehensive and was also uh, perhaps more... I, I wanted to try and get the balance right of really speaking to the players in a way that they would appreciate and understand whilst making the book as accessible as possible for anyone who is absolutely clueless about magic and is kind of just curious about it as a pop cultural phenomenon. I guess do you want to say a little bit more about how you came up with the idea for the book and how you conducted the interviews and how you got it published, stuff like that? Um, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so I, I was working at a magazine publisher for about five years in London um, up until about 2009, 2010. And um, I moved from London to Berlin, uh, where I'm currently based, to, to go freelance. And as I went freelance, I sort of realized, hmm, you know, this is a good opportunity for me to maybe write something else. I'd always had the idea that I, I might want to write a book um, kicking around at the back of my head. And one of the subjects that I thought uh, had potential was was magic. And so all the way back in 2010, I, I, I you know, had this initial spark of an idea. Um, I, I scribbled down a few notes um, and told myself, yep, I'm freelance now, I'm going to write this book. And then very quickly got, got sidelined by having to earn a living um, and, uh, yeah, sort of put it in a drawer for a couple of years. And then um, towards the end of 2012, you know, that, that itch was coming back. Oh, man, I really want to write this book. Um, and I was looking on the calendar, and August uh, 2013 was going to be Magic's uh, 20th anniversary. So I was thinking, oh, you know, if I if I start now and really crank it out, you know, maybe I could do this book by the end of 2013 and just do something for the game's anniversary. Um, but of course, on such a sh short time scale, I, you know, I hadn't really thought about it. There was no way for me really to find a publisher and, and do a proper book. So. You know, friends and uh, recommended um, self-publishing. You know, it was kind of the the thing to do at the time. And I admit, I found it the idea really empowering because I thought, right, I'm going to write this book, and I'm going to be able to, you know, come what may uh, at the end of it, I'm going to be able to put something out there. So what I initially did was research this book very intensely from the end of 2012 to kind of halfway well, so early part of 2013, and then just really go to the library every day. I was working weekends to sort of pay the bills, and then Monday to Friday, as much as possible, I'd be in the library cranking out um, cranking out this book. Uh, and I, I self-published it under the title So Do You Wear a Cape at the end of uh, 2013. Just just caught the anniversary here. And, uh, yeah, got, got some positive feedback from readers. And it kind of encouraged me to... to to pursue uh, a traditional publishing deal because I thought, oh, hey, you know, this is this is all right, and I think it kind of deserves to have a bit more longevity to it, or it, it, it's a bit more, it's less time sensitive than perhaps I thought it might be. There's a story here that's worth telling, not just because it's a magic anniversary, but because this is a really interesting phenomenon, and, and I think um, people deserve to know about it. And I think, you know, that was one of my driving. Um, kind of goals was that you know I, I do I do want magic I do want gaming I do want these fandoms and this this what gets labeled geek culture to, to be a little bit more mainstream and a little bit more legitimate you know I look at the people who make magic I look at the quality of the game still going strong after you know over 20 years I look at the people who play it to a very high level and I think these are really smart interesting people and um, they deserve to be a, a bit better known for what they're doing, really. Um, and I think the impact of the game on pop culture, particularly at a really interesting time, I think, as we were, were kind of segging from this analog world into this digital world, it did have a real influence. And, and I just wanted to get that story out there. And um, I'm very lucky that after I'd self-published, I could find a, an agent uh, in London who, who helped me um, find the publisher uh, Rebellion, who, um, who, who've brought the book out. Um, it's been really fun to work with them. Um, I think the the finished book looks great, and I, I really hope that people are willing to 
take a chance on this book, even if they don't know magic, and, and learn about what I think is a really important part of uh, pop culture. Was it difficult at all lining up interviews with these players and designers, or did you just email them and they're like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll talk to you? Um, no, it was it was difficult. Um, or rather, I mean, I, I, I think when I first came up with the, the idea of the book in, in 2010, I was like, hmm, how am I going to do this? I'm just going to go to the company and ask for some interviews. And if they say no, then I don't have a book. Well, that, I mean, it doesn't seem like such a good idea. I'm going to stick it in the drawer. Um, but it took me just like a little bit more experience, I think, working as a freelancer, um, you know, dealing with press offices, tracking down people, just, just becoming a, a bit better at doing the investigative part of uh, journalism. And also um, it took me a little bit more time I think to develop my voice a bit and have more confidence as a narrator uh, that I could come back and do this story justice. So once I'd made the decision, a couple of things clicked for me. And one was I didn't only need, or I, I, uh, I didn't only need to speak to people at Wizards of the Coast. I could really tell this story from the player's perspective, and I could tell it from my perspective too. Like part of, part of the book is memoir, and, and that was important for me because I really wanted to chart the evolution of magic as a community. And so once I'd managed to speak, you know, just dumb luck, really, once I'd managed to speak to one or two of the, the pro players who I was um, initially interested in speaking to, I got the sense of, oh, hey, you know, this, this, this is doable. I can do this, you know. Uh, and then I was really lucky with, with help from people. Um, one, you know, one, one person who really helped me was Brian Weissman, who's uh, one of the players who I mentioned in the book. And he was just really welcoming, chatted for hours. I ended up meeting him and going to his house in Seattle. And, uh, you know, people like that kind of put me in touch with other people and said, you know, there's this guy, you might not have heard of him. He's not a pro magic player, um, but he's doing something pretty cool. And it would be great if you talk to him. So I did have a lot of luck in, in that sense. Um, and I was, you know, um, quite grateful to Wizards of the Coast who were able to give me um, – uh, you know, some some interviews with key designers and stuff uh, who, you know, pretty busy people, as you can imagine, churning out magic cards nonstop. Um, and that was really great. And and I think the kind of the key for me and uh, the, the, was just a huge relief when I could uh, speak to Richard Garfield, the guy who created the game in the first place, because I just I don't think I would have been able to do the game justice if I hadn't had a chance to speak to him. Uh, you know, a real hero for, for not just myself, but anyone who's picked up the game and had it affect them in, in that way, you know, as I said, from perhaps being a bit of an outcast or looking for something to belong to. Um, he, Richard Garford is this, this sort of spiritual uh, spiritual kind of uh, father figure for all us Magic players. So, yeah, I, I think once that had fallen into place, I, I knew the book was go was going to work and, and that was just really important for me. Yeah, the chapter in the book where you meet Richard Garfield, I mean, just your, um, you know, your love for the game just shines through so clearly. Um, oh, I'm, I'm really glad. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really intimidating. It's really scary. You know, I'd, I'd been working um, incredibly hard for a year on this, this book, pretty much when I, when I met him. As I said, I was working like three weekends a month, roughly, and then working Monday to Friday on the book as much as possible. So I was pretty frazzled by the time I got to Seattle to, uh, <laughs> to meet him, um, you know, jet lagged and drinking that strong coffee they've got up there. Um, but yeah, it was a really wonderful, wonderful moment for me to, to meet Richard Garfield. He's, you know, as you can imagine from someone who has invented a absolutely uh, world changing game, he's not doing too badly for himself financially. Um, he did very, very well out of, uh, the sale of Wizards of the Coast to Hasbro uh, pocketed, I think, $100 million in the process. But he turned up and he's just an absolutely down-to-earth, lovely, lovely guy. As I said, a little bit spacey. I think he'd be the first to admit that. He's clearly got a million ideas for different games ticking away up there in his, in, in his brain. Um, but he was really accommodating. And I think he's acutely aware of not just inventing a game that people like, but having invented a game that really changed the way people feel about themselves. And um, I think we're really lucky to have someone with that kind of self-awareness be the figure behind the game. And it was just an absolute joy to meet him. Well, you kind of suggest in the book, or several people suggest that Magic is actually the greatest game ever invented. Do you believe that? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't say I've exhaustively, exhaustively tested every alternative out there. But yeah, I think... 
magic, again, this is a great phrase from Richard Garfield. He once called it the game bigger than the box. And I love coming back to that because it really is. There's so much variety in what you can do in the game of magic. Um, every single individual card does something different. And we're now up to, I think the current count is about 16,000 unique cards in the game. So as you can imagine, there's all these different levels that you can identify with the game on. You know, if you're really creative, there's something there for you to do. If you're just into the artwork, there's something for you. If you're really ultra competitive and you're desperate to win, you've got the Pro Tour to shoot for. And so, like, you have the game of magic where you're sitting down and playing with your opponent and what you're doing in that moment. But you have this whole culture around it. I mean, I personally the amount of time I have spent just thinking about the game, kind of staring into the distance, you know, on train journeys or, you know, when I should be doing something more, <laughs> more uh, constructive with my time or whatever, you know, it's, it's just so uh, modular and so perfectible that you just, it, it's like a, a constant men mental puzzle. You know, what card am I going to ne get next? What deck do I want to build? How would I play that? What would I do in this situation? Um, and it just, I, I always describe it as my screensaver. Magic's my screensaver. So when I'm, you know, when my eyes glaze over a little bit, that's when my magic screensaver is on. And I'm just thinking about the game. And that's happening for millions of people across the world because it is so absorbing and so rich and so deep um, that, uh, yeah, I think it, there's certainly a really good case for it for being the best game ever. And, and I really hope, as complex as it can sometimes seem, um, anyone who reads the book is emboldened to to give it a shot or perhaps return to the game if they, they put it down sometime in their youth. I mean, one person in the book says, well, chess, you can write a computer program that knows that always knows the right move in chess, but you can't do that for magic because the game is so much more complex. Is that? Uh, yeah, that's, that's fair. I mean, uh, and that's really true. And I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier, the, the, the variance part of the game. With chess... Um, all the information is out in the open, okay? There's no unknown information. So whoever is the more skilled player will always win a game of chess. Whereas in Magic, there is a certain amount of uh, known information. You can see the cards that have been played. Uh, they're, they're on the table in front of you. But there's also this slightly random factor to the game where you don't know what cards your opponent has in their hand. You don't know quite what cards they've got in their deck and you don't even know what the next card that you're going to draw off the top of your deck is and it's just enough of a random factor to make the game incredibly unpredictable um and incredibly exciting uh, you know it, it makes it very fun if you're invested in the game to, to watch um and kind of follow along and think oh my god oh my god what's going to come off the top of the library um and so uh, that and that that but that's also what makes it so difficult for for you know a deep blue to come and start beating the John Finkels of the world. Um, it, it's just this this balance between known information and unknown information is so so it's just so perfectly done uh, when 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 magic is done well that it it makes it absolutely compelling. It was interesting for me reading your book because I mentioned that when I was in high school, I played magic, but I certainly never got into it at the level that you did or let alone John Finkel or somebody like that. And I'm, I want to run some of the things that I didn't like about the game by you and see what oh, you of think. Course, yeah. But my, my two main objections were that um, if you, I think you said this rule changed, right? But if you lost a game, you had to give your opponent one of your cards. And I just found that like horrifying beyond all belief that I would have to give up any of my cards. You you are you are not the only one. So I think that 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 rule no longer exists, and it was something that people very quickly stopped doing anyway because yeah. uh, you know you didn't want to lose your black lotus once it'd start reaching uh, astronomical prices. Right, and then the other thing was that I just um, you know I was afraid that if I it seems like if you got into it you would have to spend an enormous amount of money to to stay competitive, and I didn't want to spend that much money on the game. Yeah, it's true. I mean, sometimes it bothers me that a big part of the game is is quite consumerist. You know, um, there is a desire uh, amongst players to buy the best cards and have the best cards for the decks, and you know, treat themselves to very lavish cards uh, to kind of uh, you know um, make their decks more fancy. <sighs> And I think there is a real balance there that Wizards of the Coast try 
uh, to strike, um, whereby they want the game to be profitable, of course. Um, you know, they need to earn money if they're going to keep making it. And, and yet they want to try and find ways to make it more affordable. Um, and it's, it's a tightrope and they don't always get it right. I think they are more proactive these days in trying to reprint which cards they can to um, help, uh, you know, to, to sort of uh, keep the, the, the secondary, uh, the value on the secondary market down. Um, but they also, you know, they're very careful in doing it as well. They don't want to completely destroy the value of people's uh, card collections. So it it's it's very difficult. It's it is an expensive hobby. Unfortunately, it's not like um, it's not like those classic games. The downside of it not being all in one box like Monopoly is you you have to keep adding to it. Um, but there are there are lots of different ways, as I said, to enjoy the way the game of Magic, and there are certain formats that use uh, older cards for example um, there are more casual formats where you well it doesn't really matter if you haven't got the latest brand spanking new card because you know you're playing with your mates down the pub um, and there's even a format uh, of the game called pauper where you can only play with the most common cards which are you know worth pennies so you know it's one of these things where the community is very aware of that and does its best to to mitigate that itself uh, and, and make make it so that you can still just enjoy the real strategic fun of the game uh, on some level. I, I wish at times it was less expensive um, and um, Wizards of the Coast have made uh, a promise to not reprint some of the game's most expensive cards. It was a promise they made in haste um, back in the 90s. It's something I think they regret um, but for better or worse they've stuck by it. Personally I would be more than happy to see the value of my collection uh, plummet if it meant that I had more people to play my Black Lotus against. Um, that's one of the cards that they're not going to reprint, um, and it, which is worth several thousand dollars uh, at this point. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I think it perhaps affects the diversity of the game. I think uh, it would be nice if people didn't feel like there was a big cost barrier to playing. Um, and it's like anything. If, if you really get into it, you, know, you, you do end up spending money on it. I think that's the same if you're playing golf or you know tennis or you know, horse riding whatever it might be there, there are expensive hobbies out there um i think wizards are doing their best to, to make it manageable um and i would still encourage people to just pick up the game and play with their buddies you know even if you're just slamming cards on the kitchen table it doesn't have to be too expensive um and the community it helps you know people lend each other cards of tournaments um you know i've had people cut me sort of deals on cards which i couldn't quite afford there's people people want to play the game people want new people to play the game they're always looking for the next opponent so again um it's it's a pricey hobby but i think um it's definitely more accessible than 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 uh, than you think and and certainly it's more accessible than i thought it was when i was a teenager because yes it did take up all my pocket money and of course it did seem really expensive at the time but i think for anyone with with a job it's much more manageable Right. And I think another reason that I didn't maybe get into it at the level that you did is there were just no gaming stores around me that I was aware of where people were playing it. Um, so I just played with like a couple of friends or relatives or whatever. Um, but you say that actually a lot of these gaming stores, you compare them to High Fidelity uh, by Nick Hornby, where they don't have the most welcoming atmosphere. Could you talk about that? Yeah. You know, I probably get into trouble for saying this. I mean, like, there's a lot of game stores out there that, that I... <laughs> I'm not a fan of the atmosphere personally. Um, it's different. I mean, when I was a teenager uh, playing the game in New Zealand, I was at the uh, the nearest game store to us, Pendragon Games in Auckland. I was there with my best buddies playing Magic every Saturday. We could get a lift. You know, I absolutely loved it. And I'd play for eight hours straight, and that's completely legitimate. And people are really into that. And you know, people people still do that. Um, I'm 36 now, and I'm perhaps a little bit less inclined to spend my Friday night in, you know, a perhaps slightly grubby, dusty game store where the crowd is perhaps sometimes a little juvenile or mostly male even. Um, it's just not the social experience that I'm looking for. Um, and I think that's something that the game needs to get to grips with. Uh, there are game store owners who are really conscious of that and desperately trying to 
sort of make their stores more appealing, make their offering more appealing. But I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a holistic thing. I think, as I said, you know, I, I kind of want magic to be a more mainstream proposition. I want people to know about it. I want people to play this game and discover it and have the same fun that I've had. But I think it's, it, it's a cultural shift that needs to happen within the game as well. It needs to be, um, welcoming and it needs to know that you know on a friday night it's not just competing against other games or people sitting at home playing D D. it's competing against people going to the cinema or going out and drinking with their buddies or whatever it is that people do with their leisure time you know uh and that means that it has to be uh has to work a little bit harder i think to be a uh, a more inclusive um, atmosphere as much as possible because there is that element, you know, the the Nick Hornby high fidelity thing. People go in, you, know, you go into a record store, you go into a game store, you've got a slightly snooty person behind the 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 counter looking you up and down, thinking ah, maybe they're not serious about this. Ah, I don't know, you know, maybe they don't belong here or whatever. And I think that's a really big barrier to 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 people getting into the game. You know, new players can find that really intimidating and I wouldn't wish that on anyone. So I would appeal to any game stores out there to just be as welcoming and friendly as you can and, uh, you know, give the place a hoover and um, just <laughs> try and um, lift magic up into the cultural mainstream so that everyone can have as much fun as we've had playing the game down the years. Hmm. Okay, so then my final strike against magic kind of was that I was much more invested in Dungeons & Dragons and oh, okay, cool. I was really interested in writing and game design and things like that. And it seemed to me that Dungeons and Dragons offered more outlets for writing and game design style creativity. Do you think that that's true? Or do you think that if you get really get into magic, it has the same sort of things? I mean, I think, I think that's mostly true. I mean, I, you know, the, the very nature of Dungeons and Dungeons and Dragons is narrative in a way that uh, the mechanical nature of magic isn't. It, it's they're two different games. So I can't promise anyone that same level of uh, sort of creative immersion. But there is a lot going on in magic that is still really, um, really stimulating on a different level. You know, I, I love to write. And yet it's a different part of my brain that I'm using when I'm playing magic. And it's still interesting because you're trying to create you're constantly trying to find the next combination of cards. You're constantly trying to build a deck that is going to beat all the other decks out there. So there is this kind of um, meta level to playing the game where you're 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 beavering away in your know, sort of mental uh, workshop, trying to put together the right contraption to to go and win the local tournament, and that's really rewarding in in some ways. And similarly, when you're playing you're not sort of playing on rails there's a huge number of choices to be made and again while that might not be the same kind of creativity you use in telling a story is the you know the, the more uh, possible plays that you can imagine the more ways of navigating these scenarios that you find yourself um in during games that's that's uh, again a huge challenge and, and, and a lot of fun so yeah it's not the same as telling stories um but there is a lot of fun to be had in a kind of slightly different way in magic. The other thing around magic is that you know, uh, wizards are very good at, um, well, they're becoming very good at telling the story of the game. So there is a more of a, a, a sort of creative fan culture emerging. There's uh, stories being written about the game. You know, the artwork's really interesting to dive into if that's something that appeals to you. And um, what's I think growing quite markedly at the moment is magic cosplay. People are really invested in the characters. They they love the artwork and they're and they're starting to cosplay those characters. And that's popping up more and more, uh, not only magic tournaments but more sort of general conventions. So, you know, different strokes for different folks, of course. But there is a, a way to indulge your creativity as a magic player, certainly. Well, I'm guessing there must be sort of magic fanfic and magic novelizations, and there's a movie coming out. I think. Yeah. Um, I admit I have not delved into the world of magic fan fiction. Um, I'll save that for a very rainy day, I think. Um, but certainly um, there is talk of a movie. Um, it's gone quiet uh, recently, but Magic did announce a little while ago that they've sold the rights to uh, a magic movie to um, 20th Century Fox. And Brian Cogman, the um, sort of writer on Game of Thrones, uh, his name you might recognize, um, is penciled in to do the script. I believe 
He should have been working on that now, but he's probably quite sidetracked by goings on in Westeros. Um, I can't begrudge him that. But it would be it would be obviously amazing if there's a magic movie. Um, I, I don't think it's personally a movie that I'm going to fall in love with. Um, but I think, again, in terms of dragging magic culture into the light a little bit, you know, in terms of making it a mainstream proposition, in terms of making it really inclusive, I don't think there's anything better still today than, a, you know, a blockbuster movie to do that. And I think if you put a fantasy film into the cinemas with magic characters into it and you attract, you know, 10 to 12 year olds to come and see it or whatever, that's really going to um, secure magic's future for another 20 years. That's the next generation of players who are going to get hooked on the game and the universe and what it means to play magic. And so I really hope that that film does come to fruition. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned that you're working on fiction. Is there anything you can say about that? Um, sure. Yeah. I'm just, I mean, uh, in some ways, um, it feels like uh, the book Generation Dex was kind of um, perhaps the, in some ways, the sort of culmination of my journalistic journey. But then writing the memoir part of it really turned me on to, you know, hey, there's other stories I want to tell. Um, I want to kind of get to grips with certain truths that I perceive about the world. And there's a certain amount of that you can do in memoir, but there's so much more you can do in fiction. You know, there's, you know, as, as paradoxical as it might sound, fiction is this place to explore um, and, you know, get really close to the bone, get get down to those truths. Uh, and so um, I, that's what I'm trying to pursue at the moment. So I'm, I'm really just tinkering away in the same library where I wrote Gener Generation Dex, uh, albeit in a different chair. Um, uh, different view out the window. No, no, no. For whatever reason, I just moved to a different side of the library. It's just, it's, <laughs> I guess it's like, I guess like I had my Generation Dex chair, and that's where I wrote that, and now I need a different chair to write fiction in. So I go and sit uh, in my favorite spot in the library whenever I can. Uh, beautiful library, lots of light. And I just chip away at writing some short stories, kind of based on uh, my life experience, but uh, also the experience of being an expat. Uh, in Berlin and, you know, having lived in a lot of countries, a lot, a lot of what I've learned uh, through that is going into my fiction at the moment. And although I've not published anything, I'm just trying to put together a good enough portfolio of short stories to possibly get onto a creative writing course uh, in the US, like a, an MFA. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much my next goal for that. And uh, eventually I'd like to get up speed to, to do another book, a, a novel probably. But um, for now I'm Still, uh, has got Generation Dex to deal with, and uh, that's 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 kind of the focus for the moment. Well, you know, there's a chapter in this book where you're you're home for Christmas playing magic with your family, and mm. it's it's really really well written. I was really struck by that. Oh, so thanks. I think you definitely have the chops if you want to pursue that. Oh, that's uh, well, I'm, it's really kind of you to say so. I'm, I'm you know, I'm really I'm really glad that uh, I'm really glad that you've enjoyed the book. Uh, it sounds like you've enjoyed the book, and I'm, I really hope people take away something that they enjoy from the book uh, and it might be something unexpected you know I, I think there's enough in there uh, and I've, I've tried to make it like I said as accessible as possible so I hope this is kind of the book that um, if people have grown up playing magic and uh, you know they have family members or they have partners who kind of don't quite get their hobby you know I'd really like to think that this is the book that you can press into your girlfriend's hand or into your mum's hand and say you know you might you might learn a little bit about me from reading this and 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 that's really why my story is in the book to be the kind of the story of the average magic player you know you've yes you've got your pros who are in achieving great things on a sort of bigger scale but i wanted to make sure that there was something in there that just your average common or garden uh magic player can relate to and, and again my experience might not be the same as uh, every magic player's experience but i do think there is a common thread in there and um i hope this helps magic players understand themselves better and uh, i hope it's something they give to people around them so uh, so they can get to know us a bit better too yeah i also just want to make a note of this that you're actually named uh, named after titus groan from mervyn peaks yeah Gas. that's right i mean obviously most people you say oh i'm titus they immediately go oh titus andronicus and i go well yeah of course but you know actually uh so i'm quite lucky <laughs> lucky <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the right word. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky. My dad is uh, a, a, a fantasy illustrator, a children's illustrator, perhaps now more 
more so. Um, but certainly when I was born in 1980, he was a full-blown fantasy nerd. And um, him and my mum narrowed, narrowed the choices down for my name to Titus, Merlin, or Genghis. <laughs> um, and uh, Titus from, from uh, Titus Grown. Um, and, and I feel like I came up, trumps actually on that <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't mind it being genghis i kind of like how badass that sounds um merlin to me always sounds a bit too kind of tie-dye trousers but um yeah so i i was definitely steeped in that kind of fantasy culture really as soon as i popped out the womb <laughs> and uh yeah i mean i wouldn't have discovered magic without that a certain kind of upbringing i mean my dad read me lots of fantasy books and comics when i was growing up and that you know and, and he always had a um an attic full of toy soldiers. Uh, he's a war gamer, uh, both historical and, and fantasy war gaming. And he used to work for the uh, war gaming company Games Workshop. So I was just, I just loved all that stuff. You know, I just was completely soaking up all these wacky fantasy and science fiction influences. And, and that's what, you know, turned me onto a game like Magic in the first place. Yeah. All right, cool. So we're pretty much out of time. So just finally, do you want to list any other magic resources people should check out after they read your book, like how they can find these competitive viewing and websites? Yeah, and like that? Uh, absolutely. Um, so for anyone who um, is starting out or kind of curious about maybe getting back into magic, there's a few different things that you can do. Um, one thing you can do is go to a local game store uh, and they should have, I think they're called welcome decks. Uh, they're available for free, and they're really simple decks just to get you started, just to kind of get you playing the game and getting used to how the turns work and all that stuff. If the game store, though, is a bit intimidating, um, it can be, and I know a lot of people have said that, one thing that's really popular now is uh, um, a digital version of the game called Jewels of the Planeswalkers, and you can download that on your iPhone, you can download it on your, uh, yeah, your games console, or on your PC from Steam. And it's a bit like a slightly simplified version of Magic where you're playing against the uh, the computer. So it's a bit more sort of, of a, an arcade-style game. And, and as you go along, you collect more cards and you battle against stronger and stronger enemies. And it's a really good way to learn the rules even before you step foot in a, in a game store. And a lot of people have used that as a kind of pathway into the game. So I definitely recommend that. Otherwise, if you're a bit more of a, you know intermediate player, there's loads of coverage out there uh, on the internet. And um, Twitch, as you can imagine, is full of people playing Magic 2, playing the online version of Magic. And that's a great way to, um, to really learn the sort of strategic depths of the game. And it's also where every Pro Tour um, gets broadcast at the official Magic channel, twitch.tv slash magic. Um, and that's also where broadcasts happen from some of the other big tournaments around the world. And again, that's a really good way to learn from some of the best players how to uh, how to sharpen up your game. So I definitely recommend that as well. I also saw that there's a podcast that Mark Rosewater records in his car on the way into work. <laughs> yeah, Mark Rosewater, the uh, workaholic. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, obviously, of course, what I didn't mention is if you are interested in magic, there is an official website. Uh, I think it's wizards.com off the top of my head. Um, and that's going to give you all kinds of resources, articles um, on the new cards and how you can build your deck with them, stories as well, if you're into the more fictional side. I think every Wednesday there's a new story about what's happening in the Magic Universe. Um, so any you know fantasy fiction fans can, can delve into that. And podcasts, including this one from uh, Mark Rosewater. And Mark Rosewater is the design guru who... Um, in whom we we place our complete and utter faith to keep making wonderful magic cards and feeding our addiction. Uh, and he has, as you can imagine, a lot to say about the game. He's got a huge history in the game. He's a really uh, talkative guy, very funny guy, and uh, he's always uh, really... In I mean, this is one, one thing Wizards are great at. They really do engage with the, the players a lot, be it via, you know, something as silly as a podcast, just, you know, recorded in a car. But um, Mark Rosewater, as busy as he is, will take questions on his blog you know, there are other Wizards employees always fielding questions on Twitter. And um, so it is a really great community to be invested in because you do get as much as possible to have a, a say in the future of the game. I'm just really curious how that podcast sounds because I'm so careful about having it be quiet and I carefully edit out every <laughs> click and pop and just the idea that maybe I could just do it in my car. That would be <laughs> yeah, but maybe you could. I, I haven't listened to Mark Rose, Mark's uh, podcast in some time, I admit. So I'm, I'm not. I can't give you a detailed 
kind of <laughs> audio debrief. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, maybe it works. Maybe, maybe, maybe he does it on the drive before he actually pulls out, and maybe you know the kind of maybe he has very lavish upholstery, and that kind of <laughs> keeps sounding good. Um, but yeah, I, I I don't know about that. Maybe that's something you can ask him on his blog, and I'm sure he'll be happy to uh, happy to answer. <laughs> um, all right, so I think we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Titus Chalk, and his new book is called Generation Dex, The Unofficial History of Gaming Phenomenon Magic the Gathering. So Titus, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, it was a pleasure. And that was our interview. So a big thanks again to Titus Chalk for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including C. Svetkov, who writes, Great podcast. Geek's Guide is always a joy. I have been introduced to many new, to me, authors and shows through the podcast. So big thanks again to C. Svetkov for that great review. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank our sponsor for today's show, Change Agent by Daniel Suarez. Learn more about the book over at thedemon.com. And again, that's T-H-E-D-A-E-M-O-N dot com. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.